Hello everyone. Uh, my talk is titled The Origin of Consciousness and Life. There have been a lot of research into artificial intelligence, but at the end of the day, intelligence goes hand in hand with consciousness and life. Actually, intelligence and consciousness and life are three different aspects of the same process. So in order to understand intelligence really, we need to understand consciousness and life. So it's really important to get the gist of what the interplay of these three entities are. Now, um, Charles Darwin, with the publication of On the Origin of Species in 1859, gave a really, really good idea of how the diversity of life on Earth came about. He put forth this idea that the variation of phenotypes plus natural selection processes would give rise to the diversity of life. Now, it took more than a hundred years after that to work out the details of mechanisms, and we are still working on it. It was the great merit of Charles Darwin's magnum opus that if we had these two concepts, variation of phenotypes and natural selection, we had a pretty good idea about how the diversity of life could, in principle, come about. The same thing cannot be said, unfortunately, for consciousness studies. We are still in the dark about how consciousness can arise from material processes. For example, some people even argue that we could be philosophical zombies, we could externally behave exactly the same way as we are doing now without any experience of phenomenal consciousness. It's entirely possible because if we study the physical universe as something that is played out by natural law, there's no place for consciousness, also it seems. So we still don't have the fundamental principles through the interplay of which we could reasonably assume that consciousness would arise. We have not written the On the Origin of Consciousness book. Somebody should write it, maybe one of you in the audience, 2000 some year. And even if we understand the fundamental way in which consciousness could come about, it might take us more than 100 years to work out the detailed mechanisms. But before we are concerned about the detailed mechanisms, uh, we should admit that we still have the fundamental principles lacking. People have been studying the so-called uh, neural correlates of consciousness, or in general, the physical correlates of consciousness. This is the idea that only a subset of physical processes in the world would give rise to conscious experience full of courier and intentionality and self-awareness. So if we had a successful theory of consciousness, we would be able to explain why and how a subset of physical processes in the universe would give rise to conscious experience. Some people argue that even thermostats can have uh, some kind of conscious experience. Some people argue that only uh, higher order systems like the human brain endowed with these linguistic abilities would have consciousness. So there's this argument about what kind of physical processes would give rise to consciousness. The fact that we cannot say for certain uh, what is the membership of consciousness is a testimony to the fact that we still are lacking in the fundamental principles. We can also talk about the physical creators of life. Uh, the artificial life research community is concerned with this aspect. Compared to consciousness, which apparently has a very clear border between conscious and non-conscious experience, because we all know from our experience that there's such a distinct difference between uh, wakefulness and sleeping. But in the case of life, uh, there seems to be no such clear border between life and non-life. For example, there's still some 
an argument uh, going on about if we should consider viruses as a part of life, or are they non-life, or are they somewhere in between. So in the case of studying life, or physical qualities of life, uh, we can actually talk about the spectrum of entities from non-life to life. That is what makes the study of artificial life really exciting. If we look back on the evolution of uh, living things, we notice that uh, there has been one important constraint, and that has been the abundance of sensory data compared to a cognitive capacity. There has been always an overflow of information, and it was within this context or constraint that living things evolved. Consciousness evolved under this constraint, so that consciousness was the biological system's answer to this overflow situation. We had an abundance of information, which we couldn't handle in to the full extent. So it was an ill-posed problem, and yet we tried to solve this ill-posed problem, and the answer was consciousness. So phenomenal consciousness, visual awareness, this uh, really great parallelism that we have in our sensory modalities. We can hear and listen at the same time, trying to handle the overflow of information uh, somehow within one subjectivist structure, and that was the overflow represented in the phenomenal overflow in consciousness. So we could say that uh, consciousness has tried to, is trying to, uh, handle this situation of information overflow, and the constraint, amazingly, has been the same all the way from the single cell to the brain. So some people argue that only human brains have consciousness, which for me doesn't make sense because consciousness, the evolution of consciousness has been a continuous process. So we should treat a single cell as much as in the same way as, as the human brain. So consciousness is a continuous process. That is why I believe that consciousness studies should go hand in hand with, with the study of life. Arch artificial con consciousness studies would have a lot to do with artificial life studies because they are the same thing. Uh, both life and consciousness has been an answer to this overfrustration and other constraints surrounding living organisms. Now, um, I believe that we need to study consciousness from the point of view of immediacy principle. Now, what is an immediacy principle? Uh, it is the idea that the nature of consciousness at one particular spacious moment should be accounted for by the properties of the physical processes occurring at that moment. Now, there could be some window of physical time corresponding to one particular spacious moment, but the fact is, consciousness arises here and now. It is not something to be explained. It is something to be generated. It is something to be experienced. So, immediacy principle contrasts itself uh, in a marked manner with statistical approaches traditionally used to explain cognitive processes, because statistical approaches, they are powerful. They can explain, account for many aspects of cognitive processes. However, at the end of the day, they are based on the concept of ensembles taking over space and time. So if you use statistical approaches to explain some aspects of cognitive processes, that is a great theory, because statistical constraints are important in understanding a cognition. However, it cannot give a direct model of what consciousness are, because consciousness is here and now. Statistical approaches goes beyond here and now. That is their great power, but that is their fatal limit, because we really need to explain the properties of consciousness based on the 
physical properties of here and now. So we should really take the immediacy principle as a starting point to explain the fundamental aspects of consciousness as opposed to the traditional statistical approaches. Specifically, I believe that uh, we should start from the Marx principle. This is the idea that um, the properties of individual entities in the universe is built upon the mutual relationships between these individuals. Uh, there is no a priori properties affine to coincide uh, with uh, the individual entities. It is rather the mutual relation networks that gives rise to the properties of individual entities. In other words, there would be a compression uh, process, so to speak, from the mutual relations network onto the individual properties of each entity. And I think this should be applied to uh, when we try to explain the fundamental properties of consciousness. Within the brain, I believe, I am postulated that there are two simultaneity processes uh, working together to sustain the mutual relationships between uh, the individual entities. One is the intentional or T simultaneity representing the international processes starting from the prefrontal cortex and going to other areas of the brain. The other is the sensory or tau simultaneity starting from the sensory areas going up to the prefrontal cortexes. So T simultaneity is top down and tau simultaneity is bottom up. It is the interplay of these two simultaneity structures that gives rise to the psychological time or subjective time in general. And it is the interplay between these two different processes that sustains the mutual relationships and the arise um, generation of consciousness through the interaction of these elements. Tau simultaneity is concerned with the formation of quoria and it gives rise to the spacious moment in psychological time. On the other hand, T simultaneity is concerned with the formation of intentionality and it is uh, concerned with the spatial structure in phenomenal experience. So the integrated parallelism sustained by the interplay between T simultaneity and tau simultaneity would give rise to consciousness of a uh, flow of Korea, intentionality and self-awareness. On top of that, and this is very important, we should have a metacognitive process. Metacognition is consciousness, and it is very hard to work out what, are, what the exact models of metacognitions are. Nobody knows that for certain at the moment. Metacognition is really hard because it is a process in which a, a, a system kind of bootstraps itself to form the individual properties of entities within that system through the interaction between the elements in the system. So there's an asymmetry really between the prefrontal cortex and sensory cortex. So we should really work out what the exact nature of this asymmetry is. So when we write, or somebody writes, the on the origin of consciousness work 2000 some year i think the elements that have been discussed so far uh, namely integrated parallelism sustained by tau simultaneity and t simultaneity and metacognition should play a role in the model and overflow would be a very important constraint on these processes we still don't know what are the fundamental principles corresponding to uh, Darwin's idea of variation natural selection in the case of consciousness studies would be. We still don't know what are the fundamental ideas that would give a reasonably good example uh, and explanation of uh, how consciousness arise in the first place. Uh, but I think I can reasonably say that the elements that have been described in this talk would give some interesting hints uh, 
about what would be the fundamental principles uh, to be included in this hypothetical book. Finally, uh, I think uh, free will is a very important aspect of free consciousness. After all, from functional objective point of view, the ability to choose and act flexibly would be the only justification of consciousness. And I believe that there would be a backdoor to causality through uh, tau simultaneity and t simultaneity uh, because we really need to explain, account for the fundamental temporal structure sustaining causality in order to understand how systems can evolve. And uh, through this backdoor, opened by t simultaneity and tau simultaneity, I think uh, in the future uh, we can probably come to a reasonable model of free will, which would probably uh, explain why consciousness uh, came to be associated with life systems in the first place. So that was my talk. Thank you very much.